Okay. Jay, can you hear me okay? You're perfect. You're crystal clear. <laughs> oh, you're good. Yeah. How about me? How about me? Yeah, back you? yeah you're good. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and we got this right, other guy. Going? Okay. America online dial up over here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, um, um, here. Okay. Uh, <laughs> he's, he's like ro you're Robotron, dude. Uh, you're, do you want me just to start teaching Ryan some stuff and 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 you can you can set up like a tin can Wi-Fi antenna or something and coach <laughs> off a neighbor. <laughs> yeah, I used to work for directing me. <laughs> <laughs> all right ryan all right man yeah. we're gonna we're gonna do some stuff so all right sounds good jay so <laughs> so I, there's just a couple um, a couple little uh, tiny things so so you guys haven't um, you guys haven't done react yet right no we have not no, no react okay okay no. and what about the the unix shell how much bash shell have you guys learned or do you know um, I don't think we've gotten into Unix. Okay. So how comfortable are you on the command line? Yeah. Um, I, I feel like fairly comfortable. Okay. So, I mean, you know how to make directories and kill them yeah. and, and do yeah. stuff. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It moves around. I, All right. Great. Yeah. We had a little... Go ahead. Go ahead. Tell me yeah, say I, what you're going to say. I, I feel pretty good on all that stuff so far. Um, okay. it, it, it's all new to me, but, uh, I feel like I've, I've picked that up pretty well. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I was actually just going through all like my old stuff today and kind of came up with some questions. Oh, um, so, well, it, why don't we, why don't we start with your questions? What are the nature of your questions? If they're yeah. about view, if they're about view. They're not going to be for me. They're going to be for Sean, but if they're just about the language or yeah, whatever. Yeah. Um, um so let's see here. One second. Oh yeah, so I guess it's like fairly specific to the superheroes API that we made. Gotcha. Um, we just gotcha. like I think all the codes kind of making sense to me, but I'm just kind of confused like how everything works together right now because we've got we have okay. like hero.js, then we have a superheroes.js. Um, yeah, so I'm just I think that all got a little muddled for me uh, at some point, but. All right, Sean, how's your internet? Do you want to take that and go ahead and answer his questions now? Hey, Sean. Okay, well, in the meantime, in the meantime, um, I, I'm just going to, I just wanted to just kind of show you, give you a little quick refresher on the javascript keyword this yeah I, I think I, I think this is like like a big pain in the ass and uh yeah it's it's uh kind of confused me up to this point okay good great all right you're, yeah. you're, you're confused okay so um i okay. guess what i'll now? you yeah. sound better so i'm gonna i'm gonna give ryan a quick little tutorial on this for like the next couple of minutes and let's see if your internet settles down and then after after i do that then then he has questions about good. the heroes thing does that sound good that sounds fair yeah oh okay. all right so i'll go ahead and stop my screen share so you can bring yours up okay okay 
All right. So how's that? You guys got that? That's Mac OS X Sierra if I ever saw it. There it is. Okay. All right. So I'm just going to do this in the browser console because okay. I, you know, there's no reason not to. And it's, it's a nice JavaScript environment. It's kind of a forward leaning environment. It actually supports more of the features of the language than node currently does. And so I was just kind of like playing with the, how to teach, how to teach these concepts the other day. And so I'll try it out on you. We'll see how it goes. So, um, and you can, you can follow along with this right in your own browser. So you could just open up a browser console and, and just peck away here. But the, so the first thing I'm going to do is I'm just going to declare a function and I'm just going to call it uh, foo for no good reason. And it's all foo is going to do is this console.log. This is, and it's just going to console log this. So that's it. So I just defined this function foo. And if I execute foo, I see what? What do I see? Uh, this is. Mm -hmm. And what is it? Oh, uh, undefined. Oh, the, the, the window there? Yep. It's this window object. Yeah. So, so what this window object is, is essentially the global object. And so in JavaScript, there's always this global scope. So if you, if you um, just try to reference a name, JavaScript is always going to try to look up that name in the global scope if it can't find the name anywhere else. So like I typed foo, pren, pren. But if I didn't have a variable named foo, the next thing that JavaScript was going to do is go look in this global scope here for, for something called foo. Okay. Right. And so when you just define a function, just a loose function, JavaScript assigns this to the global object, basically the global object. I mean, this becomes the global object if it doesn't have anything better to be is one way to look at it. Okay. So I just called foo. And as far as foo is concerned, this is the window object. Okay. So then if I define um, just a simple empty object, all right. And then I assign a property that that object, I can call it foo again. And I'm going to assign that function that I just created up above. Okay. So now I'm, I basically I've created an object and I've created a property on that object called foo and I'm assigning the foo function to it. I could, I could name it differently if that's easier for you to see. So object bar, it's a bar property. I'm, I'm assigning it the function foo. Okay. Yep. So it's the same function. If I say um, object bar equal, equal, equal foo, let's see what happens. It's true, right? They're the same thing. Yeah. Same thing. Two, two different ways to point at this function that I created right here. Okay. Yeah. All right. Uh, pay no attention to the options there. <laughs> I have no idea what that is. Uh, all right, so now, again, if I invoke foo, if I invoke that function, I see that this is equal to the window object. But yep. now if I invoke the same function, but this time the function is, it's being invoked as a property of an object. It's, it's invoked using the dot notation. So it's not just hanging there all by itself, like here, mm -hmm. it's, it's part of this object. If I execute that, oh, now this is this object. Right. Okay. Okay. So, so that's pretty much like the whole thing right there. Yeah. Um, it's e so if you invoke a function and you are just invoking it 
by itself. It will set this to the global object unless, and there's all kinds of other conditions we're going to about to get into, but, but the default case is that it's just going to be the global object. That's what this is going to be. But as soon as you invoke that function as a method of an object, JavaScript is going to set this to that object for you. Okay. Okay. Yep. Gotcha. All right. So, so like, uh, when we have been defining this, uh, we've been doing it on just like locally, right? So like, then we just use it within that function. Is that right? Yeah. Uh, like, is, is that what we've been doing, Sean? That's kind of what we've been doing exactly. So when we've usually been using this been with the context of the view app, but with John, after remember, is that hard for you to hear, Ryan? It's hard for me to hear. Yeah. So, so Sean, your bandwidth is is pretty low. You're pretty hard to understand. Just so you know. So the the we see in the code a lot of times where we need to say like self equals this right and the the reason that we run into those weird problems or or bind we also see the bind operator being used and we're we're using those constructs self equals this or using the bind operator to overcome issues with with uh the fact that when a, fun a function is invoked loose, it, it no longer has its proper context. Mm -hmm. Okay, so if I take, if I declare another variable called blah and I assign it object bar, and then I invoke blah, we're back to the same situation we were in before we get the global yeah. object, right? We've lost our context. So yeah. if we pass a function into another function and then that function invokes that function, like if we pass a callback function in and that function gets invoked, that function is just being invoked loosely. It, it, it's no longer associated with its, its object. And so we, we've lost our, our context. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's so, right. So am I back? Can you see me? I can. I can hear you oh, now. Good? I can hear you. Yeah. Okay. So, um, to write, answer your question, Ryan, when we yep. pass an object to view as an argument, yep. When we use this, then within the context of view, it is playing upon the same thing that Jay described earlier, which is referring to the context of the object. So, uh, when I use this within a method. You see me storing this in self within a lot of the methods we use for communicating with our endpoints last night. Yep. And that's because the this that I use within that first function before I go into the Ajax call, mm -hmm. that's referring to that object I'm passing to the argument of the view constructor. I store it in self, so that way, because the instant I go inside that Ajax call, this refers to the Ajax call. It immediately switches to the context of that method. Because you'll notice that within the Ajax call, this, what we pass into that Ajax call is also an object. This is going to refer to what's in there. Same with the done function. So we need to preserve that context is what it comes down to. Does that okay. make sense? Yeah. Yeah, it does. Okay. So I've got a few more things I want to show. I want to show. Mm -hmm. so, so the first one is the bind operator. Okay, so I can take um, I can declare a new variable and and I can say foo dot bind and I can bind it to to my object. Okay, so what this is going to do is this is going to take my existing function and it's going to bind. It's going to create a new function that's bound 
to this object, which means that its, its execution context is going to be bound to this object. So if I do that, okay, now, if I invoke bound foo, I actually see that I'm bound to the, to the object. I'm okay. bound to this object. So even though I'm invoking it loosely, I'm not invoking it as a, as a, as a method of, of an object. I'm just invoking it on its own. I've bound it. I've created this new function and that's now bound. And so this will be correctly set. So that's the whole point of bind. Bind allows you to, 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 to associate a function with its this context. And then after that, you're free to just pass that function around willy nilly and you know, okay, whenever it gets executed, it's always going to get executed with the correct this. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Okay. <clears throat> All right. I'm going to reload the page just so I get a fresh environment. All right. So then I'm going to create two uh, different functions that both console log. One is I'm going to call Lambda. And that that function is just is going to console log. Okay, and then I'm going to create Okay, so I've created two functions, one using the new lambda syntax, the fat arrow syntax. So if I say lambda, I'm talking about fat arrow. <laughs> okay. So that's, they're just interchangeable. So one function is being created using the fat arrow syntax and one function is being created using just the function keyword. Okay, so if I, if I invoke the lambda function, I see that the, this object is the global object. And if I invoke the func function, I see that it's, this is also the global object. Okay, so far so good, makes sense. Yep. All right. So now if I create another object and then I go ahead and I assign Lambda property, the Lambda function to the Lambda property. Mm -hmm. And I assign the func pro uh, function to the func property. Okay. So now I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to start with invoking the func function. So if I invoke that, I see, aha, now the this is associating with the object. Okay. So yep. it's changed. So that this is like morphed. It's, it, it's gone from returning the, the window object to being the window object. Now this is the local object. It's, it's, it's our parent object, so to speak. Okay, so we see that. Now if I invoke the Lambda function, I see that my this is still the window object. Okay, now this is, this is critical. This is really the whole point of lambda functions. It's the whole point of this fat arrow syntax is that when I create a lambda function like I did right here, whatever this is at that point in time, that point in the code, whatever this is at that point when that function is created, it's always gonna be that forever. Okay. Okay. Yep. So that's really the difference between Lambda functions and ordinary functions. An ordinary function, the this changes depending on the execution context of the function. If I execute the function just by itself, I get the global object. If I 
execute the function as a method on an object, I get the object. If I was to bind, uh, then I would get the bound object, okay? But with Lambda functions, you only get the this that was present at the moment that this code was run. Okay. So it doesn't matter that I assigned it to this object. This is still going to be the window object. Gotcha. So that is, that's hugely powerful because, mm -hmm. because almost always you know what this is at the point in the code that you're creating the function. You, you, you have that. It's like part of your context. So you, by, by declaring your function as a lambda, you just capture that this forever. It's just like it's done. And then you don't ever have to worry about that changing. So you can pass that function around, you can pass it into other functions, whatever. And it, you're always good to go. Gotcha. Okay. Okay. And so I think cool. this is enough of this, of, of doing this, no pun intended. <laughs> uh, and, and, and so n now that you've seen this, you know, I think as we write more code, you, you'll have a little bit more of a conceptual framework, yeah. but you know, yeah, sure. Don't hesitate to ask, ask questions. I mean, a good question to always ask yourself when you're programming is what is the value of this at this point? Mm -hmm. You know, do I know what it is? Is it what I intend for it to be? And is there a way in my code to, to, to capture that, to make, make things simple? Like before Lambda functions, we had to do a lot of self equals this and a lot of binding because we're always trying to pin down the value of this. We're trying to find strategies to sort of fix it in a way because it's such a slippery thing. This is always wanting to change under our feet. Sure. With, with lambdas, we don't have that problem anymore. We just lock it down. You just declare the lambda function and boom, it's done. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think that, yeah, that makes a little more sense going through that again. That's good. And that's beautiful, Jay. Thank you. I actually, that enlightened me a good deal. Great. So, All right. All right. Yeah. So, that was awesome. <laughs> All right. So, Ryan, you said earlier today that you were having a bit of trouble um, and differentiating what all the files and stuff like that. Like you get the code yeah. update. How does the actual project work, right? So yeah, exactly. let's open up Adam here and let's, let's go ahead and I'm just going to Adam dot my project here. And this is the stuff that you have. So there's not, there's no voodoo here. There's nothing going on here that you haven't seen yourself. Hey, Sean. Hey, Sean. So, Hey Sean, can you can you black out your video? Not not your shared desktop, obviously, but your your face. Not that I don't want to see your face, but I think you should be conserving bandwidth as much as you possibly can. I think I can. Oh, oh, maybe that doesn't work. Bummer. Oh. Um, sure that I'm the band. Oh, there it is. There you hey go. there, Ryan. Can yep. you hear me? Yeah. There we go. Loud and so clear. I'm recording locally to my computer. I'm recording locally to my computer instead of the cloud, so that probably helps a lot too. Cool. Um, oh, good, good. Well, yeah, it's like that. Uh, that file I since I uploaded to YouTube today with a 2.2 gigabyte file. Yeah. And of course, streaming that live to a server out on Zoom is going to murder your bandwidth. So right. it's 1080p video. So, Damn. all right, let's take a look here. Um, let's start with the model because I think that is a good place to start. I'm a top down kind of guy or I'm a bottom up kind of guy. So this is your superhero. This is a model. 
I always, when I'm starting a project, I start with my model because that tells me what I need to basically, what am I, what does this application need to have? Does it need to have users? Does it need to have items? Do those items need to have reviews or comments or things like that? I have a superhero. Does my superhero need to have a villain? So start with your model. Is one of my strongest suggestions. After the ILO. Uh, some people like to do top down, um, where they start with the user interface first, and we will expose you to that when we get to the React unit. Actually, when we hit the React project, we do try a top down uh, creation style, and it's very different. Um, it allows you to think more in terms of what will the user use first, as opposed to what data is driving my app. Sure. Um, and in the real world, Ryan, like it's both, right? Like okay. you can almost always g figure out a few of the things that are going to be in your model, but you probably won't figure it all out. And then you go and right. you start building your UI, and then you go, yeah. oh, right? You need to push. So you just down. kind of bounce back and forth a little bit. It, that's that's really how it ends up happening. But Sean's right. Process. Like trying both sides gives you the different feels. It's mm -hmm. good to to kind of bias towards one or the other to, tr to, to just learn how they both work because they do feel different when you're coding. Sure, gotcha. The reason I've always been such a model for because experience wise, uh, most of the apps I've built for people have been data driven apps. So that's where you really kind of have a predefined notion of uh, what your data is going to involve or be. For something much more abstract like we're doing with the, um, the morning class now, which is a e-commerce app, It's a feedback process. So, did, did we get that? Everybody locked up for a second. So uh, a, uh, I kind of missed that part. Kind of cut out. So a a mongoose so instructor function, right? Is taking an object as its argument with various parameters. So this is starting to. Sh this should start to kind of sh invoke a. Uh, you should start seeing a pattern here with a lot of these JS libraries and stuff like that. They'll make you use constructor functions to set some initial parameters and you build off of that. And then we added some methods, which is basically like saying for this data type, I want to have uh, just like an array method, I want to have this. Can't do anything about this. Um, right. So Sean is 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 dot methods, is that the documented way in Mongoose to add methods to your model? Uh oh, we lost him. Bummer. I know. I want him to go to uh, the pizza place or the Good Earth or something there in town. Yeah. <laughs> 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 yes, slow internet sucks. It does. It does. So, I can ramble on a little bit. I mean, I'm no expert in mongoose, but I'm I'm I've done a lot of uh object relational mapping, which is really what this is sort of doing under the hood. It's 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 a way of taking the records that are stored in the database and creating objects for those records so that when they come into your JavaScript code and when you handle them in your JavaScript code, you're actually just working with objects. And then you can, you can talk to those objects. You can call you methods call on those objects. You can say, uh, you know, load the data, 
save yourself, go find your, you know, related villains, all that kind of stuff. So Mm -hmm. it's, it's nice to, it's nice to be able, because, because JavaScript is an object oriented language and because object oriented programming style sort of lends itself to modeling our, our data. Like it's very natural, right? Because the data is sort of objects, right? They're nouns. They're the nouns in our application. We're storing things and those things relate to other things. And so object oriented programming style is, is, is a very effective way of kind of navigating those things. So you've got a superhero and you say, who's your arch enemy, you know, and, and you just invoke a method on that. Okay. But, but in database land, uh, the the things might look different. You know, in Mongo, it's pretty object oriented already. Like you don't get too far from that. But like when you're storing data in MySQL, you're storing it in essentially like a table, right? You're storing tables, and then you've got lots of different tables, and those tables have relationships, but they're not objects in the programming sense of the, the word. Okay. So, uh, the job of a, a library like Mongoose is to take this sort of database ish way of looking at things and translate it into a more object oriented way of looking at things so that in our JavaScript code, we can then just program that way. Okay. So I don't know if that makes sense. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think that helps. So the, the term that's often thrown around is uh, object relational mapping. Okay. Um, ORM. And so there's many ORM libraries out there. Um, there's some really powerful ORM libraries for, um, for relational databases. Some of them can talk to like all kinds of relational databases that, you know, so you just say, Oh, I'm talking to Oracle and it's like, okay, fine. It knows how to talk Oracle language versus like MySQL. SQL. Gotcha. Okay. That's pretty interesting. Yeah. Yeah. No, object relational mapping is pretty fascinating. Yeah. Uh, And it, and it, and it takes a lot of the headache away from talking to the database because instead of having to write like all this very database specific code, the object relational mapper is actually generating all this database specific code. It's generating like the select statements, the insert statements, the update statements for you. Mm -hmm. And And they're telling the superhero save save yourself or, you know, look up your villain or whatever. So you're just making like little method calls under the hood. All this database specific GORP is like going back and forth. Yeah. So Mongoose is essentially like telling JavaScript to read this code. Is that Mongoose is, is, is a bridge between JavaScript land and Mongo DB. Right. Gotcha. Right. So it sits in between those two worlds. MongoDB has kind of its own way of doing things. And then JavaScript has its way of doing things. And Mongoose is kind of a translator that gotcha. translates between those two. Okay. Cool. Yep. Yep. And like I said, Mongoose is already pretty darn JavaScripty and pretty object oriented already. 